welcome to today's lecture on the popular gothic novel. In today's uh, lecture, we're going to talk about uh, gothic elements. It's a subject I am continuing from the previous uh, lecture, and we will also touch upon concepts of the gothic sublime. Now, what are um, some of the key elements of the gothic genre? Uh, the gothic novel brings to mind a big castle. Um, so it is usually ruined or haunted. Uh, it may have supernatural presence inside it. It's so it's either haunted or it need not be haunted, but it may contain a evil, an evil lord as its master. And um, the uh, castle could also be a big mansion, a feudal manor or house, and um, it could uh, have some kind of sinister um, happenings inside it. Somebody could be imprisoned in secret. Remember uh, Jane Eyre, in which uh, we uh, we know that uh, Bertha Mason, the first wife of Rochester, the mad wife, was hidden in the attic. So um, that Victorian um, manor house um, also has sinister um, subtext to it and therefore it can be said to be uh, in the Gothic mode. But Sometimes the house need not be haunted or it need not have, uh, you know, uh, an evil uh, lord in it. But sometimes the ruins and the ruined buildings uh, can arouse a pleasing melancholy. So these are some of the characteristics um, in terms of the setting of the Gothic uh, narrative. Now, um, I want to introduce to you um, a castle called Kenilworth Castle. And um, if you look at that image on the slide, it is uh, beautiful, it is evocative, um, it is picturesque, it's, it's very pretty. And um, as I pointed out uh, a little while ago, being picturesque is also a part of the Gothic mode, the Gothic element. And um, this uh, castle, Kenilworth Castle, arouses such uh, pleasing feelings in the minds of the viewer. Now, uh, if you look at another perspective associated with the Kenilworth Castle, we have one such uh, contrary opinion uh, present in the work of Richard Hurd. And um, he suggests that, you know, when you look at such a, a, a a building, such a ruined building, such an uh, institution, um, we are uh, reminded of those wretched times, the evil times. So an indignation apparently is uh, wrought in the mind of the person viewing it. And we think back to those evil times and contrast those evil um, moments in history with the present, uh, the present being a pleasure to be in. It's a generous pleasure uh, because, um, you know, the, the people are, are under a juster and more equal government. So this is an important point, I think, uh, when we look at Gothic edifice or, uh, or Gothic narratives um, uh, in themselves. Because uh, while we are enjoying the ruins, um, it could be a ruined castle, it could be a ruined Tudor uh, manor, it could be a, a feudal structure like, like the one we find in Jane Eyre, uh, we are subconsciously contrasting um, that moment, uh, that uncomfortable, the curious moment with the present where we are more comfortable and are secure. So the, the past and the present are subconsciously contrasted in the minds of the reader. And that is one of the functions of the Gothic uh, fiction, um, I would think. So the, the, the past is brought in for examination and, and the readers are subconsciously told that this is a better time to live in. Now, further uh, gothic elements uh, would include dungeons, um, underground uh, cellars, underground passages, 
uh, crypts, um, you know, hidden uh, rooms and hidden uh, passages, uh, hidden spaces, uh, bodies buried in, uh, in, in crypts can also have sinister uh, overtones because there might be hauntings in that uh, space and catacombs which in modern houses can become spooky uh, scary basements and attics um, can also be part and parcel of the paraphernalia of the gothic uh, narrative and, and of course there are these labyrinths which i referred to in the previous lecture mazes confusing passages in which one could get lost um, if you if you think about some of the stories of Edgar Allan Poe the American writer uh, he also uh, makes use of such passages labyrinth and passages uh, in his uh, spooky uh, short stories to create that gothic terror in the mind of the person who is in the passage as well as on the mind of the of the reader who is kind of reading that experience of course, we are not focusing on the American Gothic uh, in, in this uh, course. Uh, I'm, I'm looking purely at the British Gothic, particularly the Gothic of the uh, late 18th and the 19th century. So labyrinths, dark corridors, and winding stairs, spiral staircases. And, and um, if you remember my other... Uh, course called the Victorian Gothic short story. We read a story called um, Hedgy Wells's The Red Room where many of these elements, you know, dark corridors, winding stairs are all present in that Gothic tale. And, and the popular Gothic novel kind of expands on all these Gothic attributes um, that we see um, uh, are part of this uh, genre. So what is a catacomb? Um, it was referred to in the previous slide. Um, catacombs refer to these underground passageways um, and, and these are tunnels and, and also served as burial grounds for millions of people in the ancient times. So that's what catacombs mean, underground passages, uh, which could be used as burial uh, grounds. And there's an example um, of a, a, a catacomb, the image um, on the slide is a reference to that. Further elements of the Gothic include, um, you know, shadows, the shadows which can creep out the person who is witnessing um, them. Uh, a beam of moonlight in the darkness can also be a, a, a scare, um, a, a, um, can also be cause a lot of gothic scare to the person uh, viewing it, a flickering candle, uh, which can be the only source of uh, light and it could just flicker and uh, black out, um, you know, uh, leaving the person in utter darkness and, and therefore spooking the person out. So all these um, elements which terrify um, the character as well as the reader are, are some of the attributes of the genre. An electric failure could also be uh, an element of the Gothic um, character um, because we, we should remember at this point that not only the past, not only the underground passages, um, not only the catacombs or, or winding staircases or flickering candles uh, are part of the Gothic paraphernalia. We should also remember that the Gothic also accommodates um, new inventions and uh, discoveries, um, which, um, which makes it an interesting uh, genre because we have both the uh, cutting edge modern technology, which are uh, kind of used by the author to kind of propel the gothic uh, plot. Now, let us uh, talk about the definition of the term gothic. What is uh, the gothic? And let's go back to uh, the Oxford English Dictionary to kind of map out the various meanings of the word uh, gothic. Gothic is a, is a baggy concept. Um, so first of all, it is concerned, the word gothic is concerned with the goths or their language. So um, it refers to um, the language and the attributes of this particular ethnic group, the goths. Uh, and, and these goths are supposed to have destroyed Lo Rome's classical architecture and culture. Therefore, Gothic has come to signify anything that is dark, barbaric, and cruel. 
So it is also a term of reprobation. It is a negative term used to criti criticize in a negative way um, the person to, oh, to whom this uh, term is uh, applied. And if you look at that um, small note there, the Goth refers to Germanic people and the Goths, there are two branches, the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths. And um, as I pointed out, they have, they have been uh, supposed to have harassed the Roman Empire in the 5th century. So um, th this barbaric element is associated with the Gothic and we need to understand that this is a derogatory term as well uh, in contemporary understanding. Okay, for the meanings of the Gothic, the word Gothic um, has also been used in the context of art and architecture, and the Gothic is an allusion as well to the Middle Ages. And um, the Middle Ages um, also um, would imply the medieval character. The Gothic would come to signify anything that is not modern, but medieval, belonging to the, um, you know, 11th, 10th, 12th centuries, those medieval centuries. And it also has another, um, you know, uh, slightly pleasing connotation of the romantic. So uh, medieval, romantic, but not practical or modern. So th those are some of those uh, contradictory ideas that, that, you know, immediately comes to mind. So if it's medieval, it's not modern. If it's, uh, you know, pleasing um, to the imagination, it is perhaps not very practical to the rational um, side of our brains. So, and again, um, we, we are told that it is positioned as oppositional to uh, the classical, you know, the sophisticated cultures um, of classical uh, learning. Okay, further uh, understanding of this uh, term, let's, let's come to um, another definition. So uh, the Gothic signifies a term for the style of architecture prevalent in Western Europe from the 12th to the 16th century, of which the chief characteristic is the pointed art. So again, this definition pertains to the architectural aspect of the Gothic, um, and the pointed arch is its very, very iconic um, you know, characteristic. Okay, now uh, let us come to a kind of a fuller understanding of this term Gothic. So it is historically a term that connotes barbarism and vulgarity uh, because of the, its association with the Goths who had destroyed the Roman Empire and its civilizational um, you know, uh, values. But this term was very interestingly appropriated uh, in the middle of the 18th century um, and, and used and given to a very new form of literature, uh, which is called the Gothic uh, novel. So um, it, it's, it's an interesting transfer that has happened in terms of this Gothic a term, which was historical as well as architectural, was taken and, and given to this new literary mode. And, and there are um, elements um, in, in this uh, Gothic uh, narrative which makes it ideal for it to have this particular name. And again, the ideas that we have been discussing, the fact that um, this is a new idea, it's a new uh, idea, uh, Madeleine Kavanis um, calls it a modern construct, um, you know, it, it, it's an um, essentially new mode of feeling um, that um, is kind of evoked in this particular narrative. And again, we got to remember that uh, it has a pejorative uh, connot connotation, a, a derogatory subtext, uh, and it is a label, it is a term that we have borrowed from the Middle Ages, um, you know, uh, and uh, given to the present. And we got to remember that the Gothic is a particular mode, a literary mode, uh, as well as a, a, a stylistic, um, you know, attribute, uh, which means a particular set of ideals, ideals of awe, fear, terror, um, you know, uh, ideas of incarceration, uncertainty. So all these are not very comfortable uh, feelings. So there is a kind of a set of uh, negative emotions um, which are associated with this label. And, and it is not a, a, a kind of a, a, a cultural notion which is um, associated with being positive, comfort, um, or security. Now, um, 
I want to bring this idea of the castle to the forefront in terms of the Gothic narrative. So the castle is key to um, the Gothic narrative, the, the uh, building, the key building, the domestic building um, becomes complicated in, uh, in Gothic text. And um, in Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, we have a, uh, a medieval castle at the heart of it. And uh, let's, let's kind of talk more about the context in which um, this novel was um, constructed in, in the next uh, few minutes. So a very important role in the so-called Gothic revival belongs to Horace Walpole, whose interest in the Gothic resulted in a building in building a Gothic castle in miniature at Strawberry Hill. So what um, Horace Walpole does is, in fact, he builds a, a medieval castle, and and that is um, you know remarkable because he kind of constructs it uh, in a medieval manner. Uh, I will show you images of it in a minute. So Strawberry Hill, this is Strawberry Hill, Walpole's, um, you know, invention. He, he constructs this building in that mode with all those uh, battlements and, and spires. Um, and, and this has been restored and, um, and, and, this, and, it, and the public are allowed to visit it, I think, since 2015. So Strawberry Hill had uh, and now has again, after years of careful restoration, uh, roof, battlement, mantelpieces, bristling with spires and gargoyles, those scary uh, structures, um, you know, those uh, creatures that, that, the statues of creatures that kind of scares us, stairs and bookcases copied from the tombs of medieval kings. So he was trying to kind of revive the medieval in um, his uh, uh, mansion, in his um, residence. And he uses this um, to kind of prompt uh, the writing of the castle of Otranto. So that is the most, um, you know, radical part. So he constructs the house and, and um, he kind of uh, invests the origin of the castle of Otranto within the um, space of Strawberry Hill. So this is what apparently Walpole is considered to have said. Walpole said his dream was of a, his dream was of a mailed hand on the uppermost banister of a great staircase. Mailed hand, a hand that is wearing all those protective equipment, uh, a mailed hand, and, and it was visible about the uppermost, um, you know, a banister of that huge staircase. And this is undoubtedly the scene of his dream, the dream which kind of prompted him to write the castle of Toronto. So Walpole creates this house and this house created that novel. So it's extraordinary. Um, it's extraordinary because there is this connection between the house and the literary uh, novel, that gothic novel. So the architecture seems to kind of prompt um, the novelist to write that uh, scary novel. So we can see that relationship between the house and the text, the Gothic text made very, very manifest in uh, Walpole's case. Now let's talk about um, the origins of the castle of Otranto a bit more because, um, you know, I, I want to talk um, more about the idea of the dream. Uh, so the dream is key, the dream or the nightmare is key to uh, writing of um, Gothic uh, fiction, Gothic text, and the text apparently came to Horace Walpole in a dream. And Gothic writers will often claim that, you know, they were prompted, prodded to write such um, works uh, because of their nightmare. And even um, uh, Frankenstein's origin is connected to the nightmares or, or the dreamlike uh, fantasy of Mary Shelley. So uh, there is a relationship to the subconscious of the author in, um, in such gothic uh, uh, you know, texts. The next quote is by um, Walpole. Um, is Walpole, he's supposed to have said, um, he says, shall I confess to you? What was the origin of this romance? He calls it romance, an adventure story. Um, and, and he says, I waked one morning in the beginning of last June from a dream of which all I could record was uh, that I had thought myself in an ancient castle and that on the uppermost banister of a great staircase, I saw a gigantic hand in armor 
In the evening, I sat down and began to write without knowing in the least what I intended to say or uh, relate. The work grew on my hands. In short, I was so engrossed with my tale, which I completed in less than two months. So, um, this is a work which has been inspired from the subconscious of uh, Walpole and uh, that prop, that mailed hand, a gigantic uh, hand in armor is the starting point of this um, extraordinary supernatural tale. And further interesting uh, elements in this idea of Walpole is that um, he says that he didn't know what he was going to say or, 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 or write in this novel. Everything is inspired from the uh, psyche, from the subconscious. So he's, he's just the medium. It's as if somebody is kind of um, haunting his mind and asking him to kind of write down these extraordinary events set around the castle of Otranto. So you, you can also realize um, at this point that the writer is disassociating his rational side from the subconscious. It's not the rational being which writes, it's the subconscious being. So the split between, um, you know, uh, the civilized and the um, medieval, the uncivilized, the baser instincts. It, the, that distinction comes um, comes to the fore here, and and the Gothic seems to belong to the other side, the dark side. Walpole's comments on the castle of Otranto is also useful for us to kind of contextualize the position of the Gothic. Uh, in terms of the rest of the text, the mode of, um, you know, uh, ideas that are to be found in the rest of the kind of literary movements from that uh, period, the 18th century. And he says that he has been revolting against the rules um, in, in terms of the castle of Otranto. Um, Walpole says, I have not written the book for the present age, which will endure nothing but cold common sense. This is the only one of my books with which I am myself pleased. <clears throat> I have given reins to my imagination till I became on fire with those visions and feelings which it excited. I have composed it in defiance of rules, of critics, and of philosophers. So this is uh, the talk of rebellion. Um, it's, it's a radical talk within the literary uh, domain. So what he's saying is that this is a new kind of text um, my contemporaries will not endure it because nothing pleases them but cold common sense. What what kind of, um, you know, uh, is um, attractive to them is uh, practical uh, knowledge and uh, not this work of imagination, um, radical imagination, but it pleases me. I, I'm writing this to kind of please myself. Uh, and he says that I have let my imagination lose. I, I, I became on fire. I was kind of, um, you know, uh, inspired to write this. I, I was spirited to write these visions and feelings. So all these comes to his mind, all these visions about um, the, the, the um, characters of, of Manfred and, and all those figures that we can see in the castle of Otranto have kind of come to him as if they've, you know, uh, come to him in a vision. And he says, I have composed it in defiance of rules. All kinds of rules have been broken. I have disregarded the critics and the philosophers in order to construct this uh, text. Now, um, let's talk about um, this important idea of the sublime, um, the Gothic sublime. So what is the sublime? Um, the sublime is a concept that is introduced to us um, primarily and most effectively through the uh, work of Edmund Burke, um, the 18th century philosopher and politician. He wrote a, a very famous work called the Philo a Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful. And in this work, he makes a distinction between the beautiful and the sublime, which have been very, very important in shaping our uh, modern ideas about these two concepts of the beautiful and the sublime. And Burke's um, ideas have been highly influential on the Romantic and the Gothic uh, movements, and he kind of discusses um, the human imagination's attraction towards the grotesque, um, um, the terrible, and the uncontrollable. And so 
the, he also talks about um, the 18th century preferences uh, and, and the differences between the uh, balanced and controlled appearance and um, its contrary. So what exactly is sublime? Um, Burke proposes that beauty stimulates love, but uh, the sublime excites horror. Um, anything that is very pleasing makes us love it because of its um, attractiveness, but the sublime, um, you know, it, kind of induces um, ideas of terror and horror in the mind of the viewer. So while beauty relaxes, the sublime kind of brings tension on the mind of the onlooker. And sublime is triggered, it's, it's created by extremes. Vastness, extreme height, difficulty, extreme weather, um, and excessive um, light, darkness or excessive light. So all these elements, if you uh, think about uh, it uh, a bit more, you will be reminded of the previous lecture that I gave in which we talked about um, extreme weather and um, nature being one of the key elements of uh, Gothic narrative. And we are immediately reminded of the vast, um, you know, landscapes, the frozen um, deserts um, that we find, the frozen Arctic landscapes that we find, uh, say, for example, in um, Frankenstein. So all these um, scenes of natural uh, beauty, um, you know, which creates awe uh, in the mind of the reader are sublime. More on Burke's The Sublime, he says the passion caused by the great and sublime in nature is astonishment. So when we look at something that is massive, that's big, um, you know, a massive cataract, um, waterfalls, or, or a huge um, chasm, we are astonished. And astonishment is that state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended. So, um, and, and we are horrified. So some degree of horror is kind of spontaneously created in us when we are astonished by those um, grandeur in nature. In this case, the mind is so entirely filled with its object that it cannot entertain any other. So the only uh, passion, the only emotion that such uh, grandeur can evoke uh, on the mind of the reader is, is uh, an element of horror and fear and awe. Now, how do we apply um, the ideas of the sublime to, uh, say, for example, um, a castle that we can see um, in a work such as Walpole's The Castle of Otranto? So uh, critics suggest that the labyrinthine and claustrophobic space associated with the Gothic architecture has been the defining convention of Gothic fiction since Walpole's work. So while um, great mountains, while the you know, frigid Arctic, um, you know, wastes um, have kind of caused sublime feelings on the mind of the onlooker. Uh, critics also argue that the dark passageways, the convoluted passageways, the confusing maze-like passageways, and the claustrophobia of, of um, you know, castles, incarcerating castles, also create sublime feelings on the mind of the reader. So this space is usually represented by a castle, um, represented within the castle, a monastery, a convent, or a prison, um, which is in ruins. And this kind of architectural space, the key architectural space that we find in the Gothic, the one that kind of harasses its occupants or its victims, is, is integral. It's, it's very, very intertwined to the psychological machinations of Gothic fiction, and the castle is used to evoke the same feelings of sublimity, uh, such as feelings of fear, awe, entrapment, and helplessness. There's vulnerability on the person, on the part of the person who is within such a castle and who is looking at a great big mountain scene. So the vulnerability which is there, you know, uh, in the character within the novel can also be transferred to the reader uh, who is reading it, who is outside of that novel as well. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'll continue in the next session.